I'm going to try and get us started on what promises to be a, a really um, a challenging and Im important day for uh, us at FXB Center and for all of you who have joined us this morning. Let me begin by introducing myself because I'm uh, quite new to Harvard. Uh, my name is Mary Bassett and I am the director of the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights, the host of today's meeting. Um, I have spent, uh, oh gosh, now it's so over 30 years uh, in public health practice, uh, and now I am joining um, the university with a commitment to ensuring that our work has impact in the real world. That's the purpose of public health and the purpose of human rights. And I've devoted my whole working life to the pursuit of equity, so you can imagine how important it's been to me to find myself learning uh, in my first months at FXB about the conditions of the Roma people uh, in Europe and in the Americas and how the lens of equity applies to a group that many of us uh, in the United States know very little about. Uh, FXB has been the center for work on Roma rights, and this is the seventh annual forum at Harvard. Uh, I want to, I think we should give a round of applause for seventh annual meeting. Its timing is to uh, coincide with International Roma Day, which is on April 8th. And we're really privileged to be joined by many prominent and truly courageous Romani activists and scholars who are joining us from around the globe today. There are 15 million Romani people uh, in the world, and about a million live in the United States. Uh, they ha are an important group. Uh, we often will be talking about oppression and discrimination, but it's also important to recognize the assets, the distinct and important contributions that have been made in Europe and the Americas in many fields, including literature, arts, crafts, music, science, medicine. But the Romani people throughout the world continue to be subject to rampant, deliberate, and persistent racism. Uh, this racism is structural, not just personal. It's very important to remember that racism operates not just in the minds of individuals or as a thousand personal prejudices, but is built into our laws, our institutions, our culture. And this begins the process for the ongoing production and reproduction of discrimination and violence against peoples. Uh, this is, in our world today, uh, rooted, structural racism is really rooted in the ideology of white supremacy, uh, which has uh, enabled the whole process of colonization, uh, has enabled the ongoing use of racial hierarchy in many countries, including the country in which we are now gathered, and has also affected the Roma. Uh, so the Roma are part of a large uh, network of people affected by structural racism. This past 20, February 23rd marked 10 years since Robert Korba, uh, a four-year-old Romani boy and his father were killed by right-wing terrorists just outside of Budapest. Uh, Robert Jr. and his father were two of six Romani people killed by right-wing terrorists in 2008 and 2009 and more than 50 were injured. These types of direct personal violence, though, are becoming less common, uh, but more work needs to be done to increase awareness and address the marginalization of the Roma. We also need to consider as violence the fact that people lack opportunity to pursue university educations, uh, to enter workforce, and to be treated with dignity. So the scholarship and the Romani communities have been overwhelmingly focused on Europe, where the majority of Romani people uh, live. But the span of the global diaspora offers uncharted terrain for new scholarship and comparative scrutiny. Has a population that was long stigmatized in Europe fared better in the Americas? And this year's conference, Neglected Voices, the Global Roma Diaspora, will explore this and much more. 
The intention is that this conference will serve as a launch pad for sustained investigation into the complexity and variety of the Roma diaspora in the Americas and beyond. And I want to make clear the Americas include Latin America. And I'm very pleased that we have some representatives from uh, Latin America here. We hope to help mobilize Roma activists across continents, create solidarity with other historically marginalized groups. So in the context of International Roma Day, I, I want you all to know that on Monday, uh, um, there also will be a further uh, panel discussion titled Decolonizing Feminism. Transgender solidarity, uh, transnational solidarity, transgender, well, maybe it'll include transgender. Um, uh, transnational solidarity for gender and racial equality. And this will uh, center on global solidarities among women of color, and it will feature Angela Cosi, who's here with us today, somewhere in the audience, and, or is a, will be arriving, and Patricia Hill Collins. Uh, these events are part of a concerted program of research and engagement with Roma issues that are centered on the Harvard FXB Center, and which in the next few years we hope will lead to the expansion of understanding and data on Roma in the Americas and a comparative exploration of theories of stigma and discrimination as they apply to Roma populations in the Americas. And finally, uh, a better understanding of the nature of the Roma diaspora. I think probably many people from the United States, like me, know about the Mo Roma mostly from popular culture and movies. Uh, but um, we actually need to bring more scholarship to this. So this year, the uh, Harvard FXB Center, in partnership with Vo Voice of Roma, have launched a exploratory study on the social and economic conditions of the Romani people in the United States with a special focus on stigma and discrimination. So I'd like to acknowledge Kristen Raisi, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing names properly, and Carol Silverman, both from uh, Voice of Roma, they are both here with us today. Uh, before I uh, turn this over to the next speaker, I really need to say a few words on be, uh, uh, as director uh, on thank the enduring commitment of a couple of people at the Harvard FXB Center to this issue. Uh, Professor Jacqueline Baba and Magda, we call her Margareta Mataki, have really led this work with vision, determination, and endurance. Uh, I've really learned a lot from, um, from them in my short time as director. I just moved to Boston in January. And I also want to thank the people that they've found as partners who've helped make this two-day conference possible. Let me just enumerate them for you. They are the Romani Studies Program at Central European University, uh, represented today by Julius Rostas. Uh, uh, director of Romani Studies Program. Uh, the European Roma Institute for Arts and Culture, represented here today by Timma, Timmaye um, Junghans, and again, my apologies for mispronunciations. Additionally, the Harvard uh, David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, and finally, the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs here at Harvard, represented by its director, Michelle, and she is our next speaker. Michelle Lamont, let me invite you to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Well, I want to first uh, wish a very warm welcome to Mary, who just joined our faculty in uh, January, and I just met her uh, this morning, and it's a wonderful appointment, and I look forward to uh, collaborating with you. So the Weatherhead Center has been uh, collaborating uh, with Magda and Jackie in the organizations, or at least in the support, of uh, these uh, various conferences on the Romas that have happened a few times over the years. And I must say that uh, the Weatherhead Center funds a lot of uh, programs, it's, it has its hands in many uh, pots in this university, but for me this is a pot that is extremely dear to my heart. And I was partially thrilled when uh, I discovered that uh, 
this conference was uh, being put together uh, by uh, these two uh, uh, very important uh, scholars who very much have an eye on how to use scholarship to create social change. So it's not randomly, I think, that the, the keynote speaker is a member of the UN uh, Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and former uh, UN Special Reporter on Minority Issues. Uh, you probably don't know much about me, but I will just say a few words so that you can understand why these issues are so important for me. Well, my, I'm French-Canadian, and uh, I have been interested in studies in, in analyzing how groups, such as French-Canadians or Romas, who ha that have been historically stigmatized, are stigmatized differently in the process of groupness. So how they come to be a group for themselves and for others. I'll give you just one example, a recent example, that is becoming more and more salient on uh, our campuses. Uh, we have a former graduate student uh, from our department, sociology here, that just published a book titled The Privileged Poor which is about first-generation students who attend elite schools such as Harvard. Well, this, in, he talks about a category called first-gen, as of first generation, and he analyzes how students who don't have parents who've gone to college and who often come from low-income background or who are people of color are experiencing making their place uh, in an elite institution such as Harvard and how the university sometimes has unwittingly stigmatized them by, for instance, uh, or creating very difficult situations for them by, for instance, closing all the cafeterias during spring break or having them stand in a special line when it was time to get free tuxedos to go to fancy events where you had to, you know, the line of students who could pay and the line of students who couldn't pay, which is frankly quite thoughtless, but this research has made such experiences of stigmatization visible and made the university revise a lot of these policies. I have a gra visiting graduate student who was working with me who's working on how poor students in a private university in Peru who receive fellowships because they are from low-income uh, families who feel deeply stigmatized as being poor. And this is a group where the category of first gen doesn't exist yet. They express, they experience a lot of stigmatization, but they cannot name it. So as I am gonna be a discussant this afternoon for one of the sessions, and as I was reading uh, the various papers that I'm gonna be uh, commenting on, I really thought about how, in, and I'm not an expert on Romas, everything I know about Romas has come from the various conferences on Romas that I've attended here. But I know the literature on groupness, and I thought it's a case where, you know, you don't have, a na national anchorage, and it's partly stigmatized as a group because it's not tied to a nation. So that diasporic uh, uh, state is very difficult to make sense of in a, in a context where all nations have national identities that are anchored in space. So I think it's, to me at least, from a theoretical perspective, it offers a lot of really interesting uh, insights, and I'm really eager to learn uh, from you this afternoon and uh, during this conference to try to get a get better grasp at this. I wrote, a, co-authored a book uh, which came out three years ago titled Getting Respect, um, Responses to Stigma and Discrimination in the US, Brazil, and Israel, where with my co-authors we compared how African-American black Brazilians in three groups in Israel who are Ethiopian Jews, Mizrahim, and Arab Palestinian, experience stigma very, very differently because of the context in which they live, but also about, it's about the extent to which they experience themselves as a group. So Mizrahim, who are Oriental Jews, who because they are Jewish think they are full members of Israel, at the same time are at the bottom of the labor market and just cannot really grasp the extent to which they are stigmatized, although they are, and their experience is extremely different from Arab, Palest Arab Palestinians who are recognized by the nation as the enemy within. So I think you know, what we're advocating for is for much more uh, detailed uh, analysis of the subjective experience of stigmatization, which also leads to various kinds of responses. African Americans confront they think and they reassert time and time again, you have no choice, you've got to confront, whereas Arab Palestinians ignore 
because they have no hope whatsoever. They think if there's a hope, it's in the hands of international organizations. We at the ground level are really left powerless. So in this broad landscape, I think for me, at the, the case of the Roma, it uh, raises a lot of extremely interesting uh, questions. So uh, I simply, I don't want to take more time, but I just want to say how delighted I am that uh, the Weatherhead Center can contribute to this uh, uh, conference. And I want to thank again the organizers for bringing all of us together. And I look forward to uh, learning from all of you. Thank you. Good morning uh, and welcome. My name is Jacqueline Barber, and I am the Director of Research at the FXB Center. And uh, I'm delighted to see all of you here. I'd like to particularly welcome those of you who've traveled from uh, far afield to, to join us. This is always, for the FXB Center, a very special day, a day when we use the privilege of being in an elite institution uh, to really draw attention to issues that we care deeply about, which very rarely get raised uh, in platforms like this, particularly in this country. So uh, we, we are really delighted to, to have a full room and to have the, the privilege of, of this conversation. Um, before I introduce um, <coughs> the next uh, speaker, I just want to say a few uh, words following on from the excellent comments that both Mary and Michelle have made. One of our goals in having uh, both our program and these convenings has been to situate uh, Romani people and Roma issues within a much broader context. Um, as Mary said, very few people in the US um, know anything much about the Roma not just in the US, but certainly in the US. When I ask my students, uh, very often uh, when I ask them, you know, have you ever heard of the Roma, most of the class put up their hand and say, no, we have not. Um, and then when you say, well, have you heard of gypsies? They say, oh, ah, I see. So there is a kind of a very, very limited understanding of uh, this group. And in fact, I think most Americans and indeed many Europeans just encounter Roma who are in the most vulnerable situations of all. Those who are on the streets, those who are homeless, those who are destitute, which is just one portion, of course, of a much broader, more complex uh, population. So our first goal in having these convenings is to situate um, this issue of Romani people, Roma issues, anti-Roma discrimination and racism within a broader context. Secondly, we um, see issues of uh, structural exclusion, as Mary rightly said, not just in the social, political, economic institutions that impinge on everyday life, but also in a range of other contexts. So international organizations very rarely have attended to this problem, though fortunately this is changing. And the academy and scholars have very rarely attended to this problem, which is why we're embarking on the program of work that you'll hear more about. So it's hard to find data, it's hard to find rigorous research, it's very hard to get funding to do this research. So we hope as activist scholars uh, to make an impact on that, to change that, and to introduce uh, awareness and high-level scholarship about Roma issues into the academy and to ha use this uh, information and this research to push the political and social agenda. Finally, um, I'd like to say that um, our work has shown the combination of both thoughtless or inadvertent exclusion, which, which Michelle just mentioned, and deliberate violence and stigma, both in the context of Roma issues. We recently published um, a report on uh, Roma education. I won't say much about it. I imagine you'll hear more about it. But our basic finding was that the common assumption that Roma people are not interested in their children's education because they just want to get them out to work is false. And it's been widely perpetrated. You can ask any well-meaning liberal person in Europe what they think about Roma and the fact that many uh, Roma young people have difficulty accessing uh, 
high school, let alone college, and they will say, oh, it's because the families don't care about education. And our research proves conclusively that that is false. So that's just one example, I think, of many where we are trying to rewrite the story, not just us, we're not the only ones, but we hope to be part of this growing movement. So um, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce my colleague and very good friend, Margrita Magda Matake. Dr. Matake is actually the inspiration for this program, and Mary and Michelle generally s generously spoke of both of us, but that's actually inaccurate. It's really Magda. Without Magda, we wouldn't be here. Without Magda, you wouldn't be here. Without Magda, we would not have had these meetings, and most importantly, without Magda, we wouldn't have had the intellectual and political energy to really carve out this space. It was Magda's determination, her intelligence and her enduring commitment that has made this possible. As many of you know, she has a PhD from the University of Bucharest. She is about to have a graduate degree, a master's in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School, the first Roma to get a Harvard degree. Woo! No. Uh, the first Roma to get a degree from the Harvard Kennedy School, but still, whoa. <laughs> um, and uh, she has... Um, made an enormous contribution, a scholarly contribution. She's written a lot, both in the, in the academic literature and many op-eds, many fora, many contexts. Um, and she is really making a name for herself and for her position and for the work that we do in many, many fora, not uh, to advance our agenda, but to advance a critically important political agenda. So I'm not going to take up more time, but Magda, welcome to the podium and thank you for everything you've done for us. Seventy-five years ago, on a spring day, perhaps very much like this one today in Poland, 6,000 Romani people, elders, men and women, girls and boys, who are imprisoned in Auschwitz-Birkenau, barricaded themselves in the gypsy family camp. They prepared to fight back and to stand back and to stand up against the Nazis' extermination plan for that evening. Locked up between barbed wire wooden barracks, gas chambers, and cremation ovens. They could see, feel, smell, and even touch death everywhere around them. The death of a loved one, the death of another Roma, the death of a Pole, the death of a Jew, the death of a gay man, the death of a human being. And yet in the face of catastrophe, the Romani people in the Skoiner la uh, lager stood up, spoke up, and they rose up. Hugo Helen Rainer, then 11 years old, recalls hearing his father challenging the Nazi guards. We are not coming out. You come in here, if you want something, you have to come inside. We have come such a long way since then. We have reached a point when, in some regions, Romani political thought, Romani institutions, Romani conferences, are not anymore about Roma, but with and by Roma. And I think that the European Roma Institute for Arts and Culture is a very powerful example in that sense. And perhaps um, our conference today is a tiny example of how the power of trust and cooperation between Roma can also make a point. And I think that I'm very, I have to say that I'm very grateful to Julius, Angela, Timea, and, um, and Anna for making this, uh, this happen. Yet, our Romani communities across the world are still under threat. Even more so today when the enduring belief or the racecraft of Romani criminality is exploited both online and offline as a weapon for anti-Romani violence, and is, um, it is fortified by fake information, fake DNA evidence, racist intellectuals, neo-Nazi groups, vigilante groups. How did the world react to the death of the five years old Ro Robi Chorba and his father 10 years ago in Hungary? 
How does the world react to the killing of Janula, 13 years old Romani girl, shot to death in, Hung in Greece in 2018? How about the killing of Halilovic sisters, Francesca, Angelica, Elizabeth, age four, eight, and 20, who were burned alive in Italy in 2017? How does the world react to the killing of the 23-year-old David Pop last year in Ukraine, or the cruel anti-Romani mobs in Italy and France only a few weeks ago? Is it really the racist thought of Romani criminality that allows Europeans' consciousness to, say, to stay inert and asleep in the face of so much inhumanity? Is it the racecraft of our inferiority that consents Gage? to morally justify their indifference and inaction in the face of harm and violence. Only in Italy, for example, the number of, of racially motivated attacks tripled from 2017 to 2018, and this is not an exception. And so I put a question to all of you here, Roma in the room, Roma from all over the world. How are we going to mobilize, organize, and protect our people from experiencing the violence, racism they meet simply because of their skin color, simply because of their Romani origins. No matter whether we live in Eastern Europe or Western Europe, the US, Brazil, Argentina, or Canada, we are all doomed to being blamed collectively simply for being Roma. But as our friend James Baldwin and a dear an author of mine would say, we can only be destroyed if we believe that we are what the white world tells us we are, criminals, lazy, less human, less worthy. We may be a neglected people, but we are a dignified people too, very much like the 6,000 Romani people who resisted the Nazis or the Netochi Roma who escaped from enslavement in Romania and created their own communities in the Carpathian Mountains. Very much like the Vlach Roma, who left their oppressors after the, the abolition of slavery and searched for respect and dignity in North America or Latin America, and perhaps some of you here in the room are descendants of those slaves. We see, we, we are told that we are a nation of survivors. And we often forget about our ancestors who stood up and resisted in the face of misery. And too often we forget to honor them. Too often the lack of spaces, memorials, history books, and museums prevents us from remembering. And yet it is because of a small group of Romani activists that we are here today, and that in the past half a century we have been able to mark April 8th as the International Romani Day, as a day of remembrance and, commence, uh, and celebration. Remembers because, remembrance because we remember the persecution of our communities in Europe, discrimination in Latin America, stigmatizing in North America. And the Gajo world can and must learn from the fascinating history of our people who from one generation to another have managed to remain compassionate not hostile, forgiving, not vengeful, and unfortunately even obedient to the, to the oppressor, and yet still aware of the injustice that they have experienced, and they will experience, despite repeat, repeated evidence of their own humanity and respect for the rest of humanity. Celebration because we embrace our rich global cultural heritage, but also our gains across countries, and the cross uh, centuries, nothing really makes my heart tremble more than young people, young Romani people who overcome. Adolescents like Sara, who lived in a, as a child in Romania and she was deprived of many, many joys of childhood and good formal learning, and who is now one of really the top students in her high school in uh, Las Vegas. A random Harvard student from Puerto Rico who confesses to me about her Romani heritage and made me want to cry when I saw that she had lost her connections with our people, with our history, and with our roots. Adolescents like Sylvia, adopted from Eastern Europe by American parents, who excels not only in her education, but also in her Romani activisms, act activism. 
young people, young Romani people featured in newspapers, on TV, in magazines, as the ones that were featured in the Zig magazine this spring. And Glenn, I'm really grateful to you and Jonathan for giving voices to, to our people. But when I look at these people, I cannot help but imagine how the lives of million others of Romani children in Ukraine, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Bulgaria, or Brazil would look if they are not stripped of their education, if they are not stripped of their rights, childhood, and dignity by racist ideologies, racist institutions, racist societies, how their lives would look if they were not punished because of the color of their skin and then their Romani origins, how the life of Robi Chorba would have looked if he was alive today. So it is time for us to mobilize, organize, protest, and protect. We have differences, and that is normal given the fact that we lived in different circumstances across the world. But we are a global people with a common history, with a common language, with a common grief. And we must act and we must learn how to act together. The physical, economic, and cultural violence against my own great-great-grandparents who were slaves in Romania was triggered by the same anti-Romani ideologies as the genocide of some of your grandparents who were killed during the Holocaust or during the Spanish Roma Great Gypsy Roundup. We are and we must stay an awake people. Here in the room, we have some of the most brilliant and dedicated Romani activists and scholars in the world. And while each of any, every one of us tries to be the best we can be in our careers and lives, we also have a duty, a moral duty, to, the, to do the best we can do for our people, too. It is we who can together make a more forceful claim, demanding justice, dignity, reparations, and rights, not integration and aid, demanding accountability from the oppressor, not pity for the oppressed. It is us who can come with a new political Romani thought, and this is us who, who can show that this political Romani thought has just been born. We are and we must become a, a united people. And if 17 years, 75 years ago, 6,000 Roma united against the Nazis, perhaps so can we, especially today in the age of global communication. And so should we, as Roma are facing old but also new challenges today. We need to learn how to fight back together against violence, segregation, and killings, but also against fake news, also against false accusations, neo-Nazi groups, groups, and also hatred and that is happening online and offline. As the Gaja world really use and reuse the racecraft of criminality to neglect, to reject, and to dehumanize all of us. And yes, yes, we are and we must remain a, a hopeful people not naively optimistic as we are, we are in the face of a fright, frightening decade ahead of us. But hopeful, hope, hopeful and persistent in our, in our actions to live up to the standards, to the struggles for justice and to the courage of our ancestors. Hopeful and strategic in joining our forces to stand up, to speak up, to rise up, not just for the Romani people in our own village or in our city and country, but for Romani people across the world from Greece to Colombia, from Texas to New York, from France to Canada, hopeful and caring for humanity because we are a forgiving people. We are a compassionate people. We are a resilient people. We are a dignified people. We are a global people. We are people. Tavis Bakhtalor Romalen, Budbak, Taisas Stipen, Happy, peaceful, and blessed International Romani Day.
I wanna, I, I, I'm, I'm really, really grateful, but I do wanna take a moment and thank you all for joining us today. Um, and I'm grateful to er each and every one of you who agreed and who was able to, to be here at this conference today. I would like to thank to Julius, Kata, and Angela, as well as Timea, Anna, Mari, and Michelle for their partnership. Honestly, we could not have done this without you and your organizations. Um, I'm very grateful to, to Helen, who has been my, my, my friend uh, and my companion in these past seven years, and she has been the greatest volunteer for Roma Rights in, in Boston. I'm also grateful to, to Mary and to Jackie for trusting me and the FXB team to put together this event, which along with setting the basics for more comparative knowledge, it was also aimed to provide a space for transcontinental solidarity among Roma, and I think you can get a sense of that in, in my speech, from my speech as well. But this has been really a tremendous effort of, of the FXB team, and you cannot really imagine how much effort my colleagues have put into this conference, so thank you so much, Mariani, Hamid, Rebecca, Josephine, Veronica, Susan Lloyd, Lena, Lena, Hector, um, Arlen, Murphy, Ariane, Elizabeth, Jonathan, Denise, and everyone else at the FXB Center. Let's give them a big round of applause. They really deserve it. I, I'm gonna finish by saying that I really wish all of us a very fruitful, engaged, and wise working day. But please do keep up the conversation, keep up the critique, and keep the heat, also keep the heat up. Thank you very much. So now you see why Magda is our, our fearless leader. Um, so um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, we're all keynote speakers, but some are more keynote than others, and we're very lucky. <laughs> we're very, very lucky to have someone who so beautifully fits uh, the goals that we set ourselves for this meeting, someone who has an international vision, someone who shares our political commitment to change, and someone who has great experience of successfully doing that. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Rita Isaac Ndiaye, who is a member of the United Nations Commission <coughs> on, Committee sorry, on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And as you heard, she was a former UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues. She's Hungarian, and she has a long history of participation in uh, national and international governance and uh, um, structures, so she's very well positioned to contextualize uh, the struggle for Romani rights within a broader framework. So thank you so very much, Rita, for joining us today, and welcome to Harvard. Good morning, uh, friends and colleagues. It's a privilege to be here and see so many faces I haven't seen for 10, 15 years, I think, some of you. And it's, it's a privilege to, to be here and listen to Magda, and it's also so difficult to speak after her, because I think like nobody can add anything to what you have said. It was so brilliantly put and so inspirational, and. And I really want to thank you for making this change here at Harvard, because I think you are just a demonstration of how um, one person's presence can make a change, especially when it comes with that commitment and professionalism and expertise. And I think we are really, really proud of you, and we know that we would not be here without you. So keep up the good work, and you, I think you really make all of us very proud. And we know that without you, this would not happen. So thank you. And my role today is here a bit, um, I think I will be much drier <laughs> than Magda was because I actually, um, I was requested to talk a little bit about like the broader context in the United Nations and the work, what we do with the Roma in the UN context. So that's what I would do. 
but I, I just hope that we also had that space for a discussion about like how to actually build this Romani movement that Magda talked about. And many of you in the room, you have been part of already emerging movements, especially the women's rights groups that have faded away, that died for a reason. And that we always wonder why, and we always wonder how we could rebuild that, and how we could have that transnational solidarity. And we have so many good thinkers and activists in this room, so it's not my role today to trigger a discussion on that, but I just hope that we can actually do it eventually today, somewhere in this room, and I think some of us stay for tomorrow. Because I think the key is actually to build that critical mass of um, intelligent and committed Roma people. Because if we have that mass, we can make the change. But if we are just individuals um, struggling alone, we have very limited opportunities. So I must say that I'm really happy to have this um, focus on the diaspora, although I'm not sure about the wording. Because I think, depending on how far we go back to history, even European Roma diaspora, if India is our home. And then the question is, who is in India? So it's, um, it's a tricky word, but I, but I do welcome the focus on outside of Europe. And also for a very selfish reason, which is that the UN has always been a very keen partner to Roma rights protection. But it has not always been seen uh, like that by Roma communities. And so if you step out of the European context, it's better like this? Or I have to put it closer? Yeah. Uh. Really? Yeah. OK. It's better? Yeah. OK. So if you talk about um, Roma outside of Europe, um, naturally the UN will come into a greater importance because in the European context, of course, we have the European Union, we have the Council of Europe, and we have the OSCE. So the UN has been somehow sidelined and neglected, ne neglected or even forgotten. It was not really being seen as a key partner. But when you actually look at Latin America or the Middle East, the UN does come in as a very important player. And I looked at the history of how the UN has been dealing with the Roma issues, and it's massive. Um, if you look at the treaty bodies, because I'm now here as the reporter of the UN Committee on Racism, so my committee has been talking about Roma issues in the context of Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Brazil. The Human Rights Committee also addressed the issue of um, the Roma in Brazil. The Committee on Torture has talked about the Roma in Russia, so that has always been somewhere around our and us. And if you look at special procedures, the special reporters, independent experts, or working groups, whenever they issued um, reports on s water and sanitation or, or health, they always tried to talk about Roma people in the global context. And when I was a special reporter, I, um, of course, did, uh, well, every time I went for a mission, I tried to find the Roma people. Now, when I went to Moldova or Ukraine, it was not like a very difficult task. But when I went to Iraq, for example, it was very challenging. Like, I've been traveling around Iraq. Um, it was a very particular time in history. So, of course, I was looking at, like, the Yazidi and the Christian situation, and I went to IDP camps. But even then, I insisted that the decision makers should show, show me Roma people. And so all, like the prime ministers, um, I met both in Kurdistan and in, in Iraq, um, and all the big decision makers and leaders said like, yes, we know about them, but we don't know where they are. We can't locate you and we can't help you. Now, I was lucky in Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka, I did find Roma representatives who came to my meeting. It was quite amazing to, to see them. And when I was in Brazil, and I'm happy to see at least already at three of you from Brazil, um, when I went to Brazil, I had the same in Salvador. I just told my team that we need to find the Roma. And so we were just going around the town and asking people, where are the Roma? And so they were telling us, like, you know, they used to be at the petrol station, they used to be here. So actually, we just went like from one like informator to another one until we actually find a few houses. And then we went inside, and I explained, like, I'm actually an activist, and I just came to see who you are, how you live. And it was like 8 p.m. and it was so suspicious and why did I come and who am I from? And, and so I always tried to reach out to the Roma communities and it was, it was always, um, well, interesting to see how they, were, they got lost in the bigger like, issues. Because in Latin America, it's really the Afro 
population and the indigenous peoples. So even if they know about the Roma, it wouldn't get enough attention. In the Middle East, again, they have their own crisis. So even if they have a Roma population, it would be somewhere there. And now it's interesting because the danger in Europe is the, the opposite, that the Roma are always framed as like a very special group with very special needs, but not again in the monetary rights framework. So it's interesting how we just struggle to place Roma people and the situation of Roma into the right context. And maybe for just for your interest, um, are you familiar with the universal periodic review process at the United Nations? Okay, many nodding heads, it's good. So I looked at the UPR because you know there are member states issuing recommendations to member states. So it's being taken very seriously because it's a peer review and it's very political. And I looked at the recommendations that member states give to each other on Roma. So during the first cycle, there were 234 recommendations altogether on Roma. In the second cycle, there was an increase. It was already 375. Interestingly, none of them outside of the European context. 270 was issued to the Eastern European group, but none to Russia. Just, um, it's interesting. And then 105 of them were issued to the Western European and others groups. Now, in the third cycle, which started only 2017, we already had 61 recommendations. And interestingly, the first time in history, we had two to Ecuador. And one recommendation came from Hungary, and the other one came from Bangladesh. They were both noted, not accepted. But it's interesting to see that even the, U, the, the Human Rights Council is now somehow more attentive to, to the Roma issues. And I'd just like to reassure you, my committee, the third committee, poses questions to member states every single time when we suspect that there might be Roma people. So we ask the question from every Latin American country, every Middle Eastern country, and while the responses are not very Satisfactory, like often we hear like, yes, it's an issue, we know about them, but we don't know anything about them. This is what we always hear. But this is just to tell you that they are not, the, 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 the Roma people don't keep the, the attention of the, e, the UN. They are very much in our DNA, and we really um, wanna um, structurally um, deal with, with this issue. Um, now, I, maybe just a little history and I apologize if you already know about it. I actually have been asked by the Human Rights Council in 2014 to come up with a report on the Roma. I don't know whether you had seen it. it this resolution was tabled by the Russian Federation. As always, it had a geopolitical context. We don't need to get into that. But anyway, it was a good initiative. And so the Russian Federation stabled this resolution which invited me as the then Special Rapporteur on Minorities to come up with a global study on the Roma. And you don't need to know this, but if the Human Rights Council issues a resolution where somebody is invited to do a job, there's no budget. You're invited to do it and you have to figure out how to do that. Now if the word is requested, they actually give budget for it. So we were trying to lobby hard to have the word requested the word is invited, which meant that I had no additional human resources or financial resources to do this study. So it was really my very committed assistant um, and myself who actually had to come up with creative ways to do this. We couldn't organize regional consultations. We couldn't really reach out to people. What we did, actually, we sent questionnaires to all the member states. We received quite a few, and I looked at the ones that came outside of Europe, again, just for your interest. So Argentina replied. Um, Belarus, which is usually not, um, it's not in our radar, Ecuador, Guatemala, and Uzbekistan. And they are all on the website. They are usually in Spanish, um, but it's, it's, it's possible to translate them. And then Mauritania, I <laughs> heard in one page, think like they don't have any Roma living on their territory. And I, we, thought, we thought that much. Um, so we actually, I gathered these questionnaires, and then based on that, we did come up with a global study on the Roma. And I saw it as a real opportunity to get outside of the European context and then try to be very UN about it and be very global. We struggled around information and data and we were really sweating blood to, <laughs> to make it uh, accurate and informative. And if you don't mind, I don't wanna be too long, but I would just like guide you through quickly through this report because I think it does have some interesting aspects of it. And so, I will tell you a few data about Roma outside of Europe. 
I mean, this data was already a bit outdated when this report came out, so now it's even more, but I think we don't really have anything better at the moment. But I also know that there are Roma people from these countries, so I'm really looking forward to hear your updates later on. Um, and what is really um, striking is the difference and the discrepancy between the official data and the estimates. And so in Turkey, for example, this, the data is between 500,000 and 5 million, which is like a 10 times difference. So in Ukraine, um, there was a 2001 census. There were 47,600 people who identified themselves as Roma, but the Council of Europe estimated up to 400,000. So again, it's like a 10 times difference. Then um, Russian Federation had a census in 2010 when 205,000 people identified as Roma. And again, the Council of Europe puts this number between like half million and 1.2 million. And then Latin America, um, there was a 91 study, this is really old. Um, from the UNESCO, they were put the entire number of Roma in Latin America to 1.5 million. What we know from Brazil is that they estimate a half million. And then North America, while well, we have all the Canadians here, they will tell us more about it, but um, they say that um, um, it should be up to 110,000 people, although um, indications are around 5,000. And then you have Central Asia and Middle East where we really don't have any numbers. We just know that there are communities, but, I, but as I told you, even me struggle to actually find them and get some data. Um, what I was trying to do in this report, and this is what I already told you in the introduction, is to actually place the Roma issue into the minority rights framework. Because what happens is that every time when any state or government talks about the Roma, it's like a special group of people with a special problem. It's a social issue, it's this poverty paradigm, it's, it's something completely taken out of the rights context. And this is really tricky. Because if you take out the Roma from the minority rights framework, then it means that you actually don't have certain obligations, but you do. Because if you actually deal with the minority rights framework, there are four pillars. I mean, it's a simplified, but I think it's still a very digestible uh, approach. There are four pillars that we need to keep in mind. One is the protection of existence and the prevention of violence, right? And I'm happy that we have um, uh, the, the special advisor's um, uh, team member with us, <laughs> because I think he will maybe reflect on this a bit more. Then we have the protection and promotion of identity. Now note that this is two words. It's protection and promotion. And I will maybe talk a little bit about this later. The third pillar would be equality and non-discrimination. I think this is what we hear most about, and we have data about, you know, like different areas of, of discrimination, and the fourth is participation. So if you actually place the whole Roma issue into this, it will give you like a much better understanding of what governments should do. And so when it comes to um, the protection of existence, it's not only history, and it's not only the primus, although it was so uh, beautifully reflected in Magda's speech, but as she pointed out, it's about what we do today about violence, how do we pre prevent it? was the role of law enforcement um, uh, bodies and was the representation of Roma in these law enforcement bodies and how do you build that trust and again was the reaction of public um, uh, um, players when it comes to violence and, and, uh, and, and any attacks and harassment in the communities. Um, and then the protection and promotion from identity, it's funny because we actually do see good examples because that's the easiest thing, you know? You give a little bit of money to let them dance and let them sing their songs and you know, like, we are done. And so I think like this is where governments feel like we do so much. But then it's, it's not only that, and again, it's a trap because, um, so states have the obligation not only to protect trauma from forced assimilation, but they must adopt positive measures that promote the distinctive characteristics of Roma culture, including language, history, and tradition. And that should be achieved through financial and technical assistance to preserve the Romani language, art, poetry, dance, music, traditions, including the promotion through media. And school curriculum have to reflect the same, and there must be a, an opportunity for self-interpretation and self-representation. Now, if you think about that, now this is when it gets interesting, like how are Roma portrayed in the media up to today? Who are painting that, that picture? 
and how is it painted? Is it self-representation and self-interpretation? Um, uh, or is it through the lens of the majority? And I'm happy that Ariak is here because I think they have such a crucial role. But again, this is a public foundation, a, a private foundation, and it's not the actual states who are doing it, and it should be their tasks. And then in my report, I talk about some examples from Argentina and um, Canada and Turkey about TV shows that were misrepresenting the Roma. And in terms, actually, in, in, the, in the case of Canada, there was a, a, um, an, an apology issued, and it was removed um, from the web page. So there were some positive examples, but it's we are far away. Let me know then. Who is no. the timekeeper? The, the yellow look? chair. You have to be worried about the, the yellow, yellow chair. chair? OK. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> OK. Now, on equality and discrimination, this is, I think, where we know most. This is the third pillar I mentioned to you. So I wouldn't really linger on lot, lo a lot. But I just mentioned you maybe Lebanon. There was a research that um, so 68% of school age children are not in school. And this was the main uh, factor leading dom children to be uh, on, on street labor. Then we had the data from Kyrgyzstan, where in 2004, the unemployment rate among the Mugat Roma living in Osh region was 90%. Um, so even if you look outside of Europe, you really had bad data. But of course, in Europe, we have the Fundamental Rights Agency, and we have all the latest updates. So it's a bit easier to know where we stand. And then the last I would mention quickly is the right to effective participation. So. Um, the commentary on the min minority declaration says that the right to participate in all aspects of life of the larger national society is essential, both in order for minorities to promote their interests and values and to create an integrated but pluralist society based on tolerance and dialogue. And I think this is where we come maybe the shortest. And this is, I mean, I think I have been speaking about it for such a long time. It's just unjustifiable after all these years of um, um, this birth of, of the massive um, um, uh, group of Roma intellectuals, why we are not in decision-making process, processes. I just, can't, I just can't get it. I get a lot of things about like why things don't move ahead. It requires money. It requires coordinated policy responses. It, has, it needs strategies. But why we don't have Roma people in decision-making positions, I just don't get it. There's no excuse. There's no explanation. Like, I was sitting on the board of the Roma Education Fund, the advisory board on giving out scholarships to Roma young people. We sent Roma people to all over the world. I was so happy to do that, that pro bono job because I've been looking at all these TVs and we have been giving scholarships to Roma people to go everywhere in the world and thrive and they came back with the diplomas and you don't see these people. Of course part of it is that they actually get somehow um, isolated or they get too distant, distant from the Roma community and the, the movement that I get it as well. But there are those who really want to work and so if they apply for a government position they would end up like making coffee. And the other thing that I, I, all, I am very worried about is that I call as an intellectual ghetto, that if you are a Roma person, somehow people always believe that you have to work on Roma and you can't work on anything else, because inherently that's what you know. And it's a completely different subject. I don't want to divert, but in my own career, that was like the biggest um, obstacle, to actually get out of the Roma rights context and be a global minority rights advocate. Because I was always told that if you're a Roma person, you should stay with your Roma. That's what you know. This is who you, they, they know you. This is what you can do. And then why would you be like working on a Yazidi IDP camp in Iraq? Why would you work on like a Quilombo community in Brazil? And it was such a difficult task to prove that we Roma can do whatever we want, you know? <laughs> Whatever, and it's funny how we still like have to argue and have to prove and reprove and you know go beyond like every possible um, measures to to prove that point. So this is where I I, I get shocked Dante, today. Why I just don't see even at the, like the European Union meetings, the Roma contact points. I mean, how how did we end up with all these non-Roma in a closed group um, with uh, with meetings that are non-transparent? and non-broadcast, and they have these secret meetings where non-Roma people decide about the fate of the Roma. And I'm like, if I put it in the context of the United States of America, can you imagine like 20 
seven, 28 white people coming together to decide about like an African American strategy? Like, do you think? <laughs> no, no. There are structures. This, this will be a great point for discussion. Yeah. It does not happen. And whether it's meaningful, but the political correctness here, at least, it's on a different level. In Europe, you can do it. There's no problem with people coming together with no representation of Roma deciding about Roma. There's no issue with it. Here, there must be protest. There should be protest. There would be massive outrage. But in Europe, if, especially for like the non-Roma people, it's fine. You know, they know what to do. They can decide on uh, on behalf of the others. And this just like freaks me out. I I don't see it anywhere else. And it's in the, the context of Roma. This is like one of the most accepted things. And I I think we have to change it. And how to build a revolution, I don't know, but I'm part of it. So let me know. <laughs> if you figure it out, Magda, I think you can build it, and then I come and join you. <laughs> now, um, I maybe I just wouldn't go into these details. This, this report is really available. Um, but um, you can put that details on the FXP website yeah, yeah, so yeah. that I'm everybody can just, download it. Yeah, I think we can make it downloaded. And then if, if it's possible, because then I don't like go into the details. One last thing maybe um, as just a personal experience that I'd like to share is that I did go for an official mission to Brazil. And then we had this commitment with my team to actually organize this one day Roma workshop. And I'm happy again to see one, two, Dafina was there. Yeah, I think two, three people, from, no, two people from that workshop. So what happened is that again, the UN didn't give me any budget, there was no support, but it's like, if you wanna do it, do it. And so with my team, we actually managed to like have some extra funds and then we flew people to, to Brazil for one day. And I know it was not enough and I, I know it was a mess because we only had one day and we wanted to like do so much. But we actually had um, rep, like, people coming from Argentina, Chile, Ecuador, Colombia, Canada, Brazil, and Peru. So they came to the, to the Roma workshop, which was at the end of my official mission, we just added an extra day. And it was fascinating. I never knew that I would feel just like I would feel in Eastern Europe. You know, like people came with the same vibes, with the same language. Um, the same body language. And it was all like all about like very passionate talks. And I think what I took away from that meeting is that they really, really want to be connected to the European Roma movement. They feel like European Roma are so much more advanced, which is true because I think that we had opportunities to better organize ourselves. But I think we really need to create those bridges with the other Roma communities because they really want to be part of this movement. And as I said, one of the dangers is that they are really not visible. We have to find them. We have to do our own research to find these people, but we really have to incorporate them and include them and to embrace them in this larger movement. And one interesting, um, maybe just, just, an, uh, an, uh, just an element to it, an interesting element that in Brazil there was um, um, a minister who was in charge of racial equality, and she was a black woman. So her ministry was in charge of the Roma issues. And it gives such a completely different context. Because when we had the Brazilian government coming and representing, it was actually a black man who came. And he was like, I'm the one who is in charge of the integration of the Roma. Because Brazil does have programs and plans, and, and they really actually do a lot about Roma integration. And I found that it gives such a nice touch to this whole dynamic, because when you have Afro people in charge of the Roma issue, there is all this understanding that comes naturally. You know, you don't have to convince the white man that you are stigmatized and you have hardships. It's the black man who sees us like, hey guys, I know, you know, I know, believe me, I know. I've been through that shit. I understand you, okay? <laughs> so I think it was so nice that, um, which is, that was just this, this really natural understanding and, 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 and connect. And I think this is also one of the, the, the advantages with the Latin American region, at least, that there are always other people who can like, advance the cause and who understand and who support. And I, I, I did feel um, that that could be something that, that would be helpful. And um, yeah, so I'm, I, I think I will finish here. I think that's all I, I just wanted to say on the challenges and possibilities side. Um, and 
Yeah, and I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm very happy, of, of course, from the UN side to, to continue the work on it. So if you have any other creative ideas on how we take this forward and how we connect and how we make this well, international Roma movement, I'd be very happy to figure out what we do next. So thank you. <laughs> Rita, thank you very much for that uh, wonderfully panoramic speech, and I'm glad you thought it was dry. I wonder what wet looks like. <laughs> um, but um, I think your, your comments took us from questioning the, the kind of term diaspora right through to data problems mm -hmm. to the, you know, constant question of, of ghettoization of minorities, um, right through to this uh, inspiring idea of building solidarity across uh, oppressed groups. So it was exactly what we wanted. So thank you so very much. Um, we're very lucky to have another um, leader who works within the UN context uh, join us as a discussant, Frederick von Bortmer who is a UN, um, works in the UN Office on Genocide Prevention and the Responsibility to Protect. Um, 